you a link of that once we're finished. We're working until the middle of July. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is our interviewing and oral history collection week. Mm -hmm. Just trying to give people stories, perspectives, Good. relationship. What we have to do here is a little, a little uncomfortable. Here and probably yeah. sit close to in you. order to get the best sound. <laughs> My name is John. Nice Hi, to John. Meet you. John and John, that's good. Yeah. And Matt. Matt, I'm Katia. Katia. Yes. Nice. It's going to be a little bit awkward because mm -hmm. in order to get the best sound quality, we're using a Zoom recorder. It has to be held quite close to your mouth. Uh huh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Would you want me to hold it? No. No? no. Okay. It'll hurt your arm. No, oh, okay. Disgust. It'll hurt my arm? Well, oh, I don't think so. I don't think so. My arm ached after holding okay. it. In this position for an hour. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. It's like singing in the mirror. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So just ignore the recorder. If at any point you're uncomfortable, mm -hmm. we can readjust some things. But mm -hmm. um, just focus on the questions, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so this is information. These two sheets um, mm -hmm. require signatures. Mm -hmm. The one page sheet, this one is this basic one? info. This one is just information about. The project again, and then it's a voluntary participation basis, so you're agreeing that you are participating in the interview sure. on your own will. Yep. Um, there are no risks or benefits to the, the interview except for the contribution of, of extra knowledge to our research mm -hmm. project and to the community. Mm -hmm. um, and if at any point you would like to take back or redact a statement, you can definitely do so. Just contact our professor, or if you mm -hmm. know ahead of time, you can tell us and we can write it down. Um, I think that was. Okay, well, uh, yeah. yeah, oh, and it's not a confidential interview, so our, your name will be included when we talk okay. about okay. these stories. <laughs> so if you are okay, okay. with that, either, um, yeah, which, uh, yeah, so if, if you don't mind just writing your name. Want me to write it here? Mm -hmm. Okay. I use three names because... For many years, I went by Barbara Brown mm. in the profession. Then I got married, and that would have thrown people. So I use three separate names, if you wonder why. Mm. Also, with a name like Brown and Lee. And of course, it comes out Brownlee, and it comes out hyphenated, and it comes out all wrong, spelled wrong. So, you know, in case. Okay, you want it here? Yeah, your printed and signature and then your street address. Did you get the two forms from our earlier Milwaukee Art Museum. Okay. Yeah, whatever address. Is that all right? Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. I don't give out my home that's address. Fine. That's totally fine. It's more just for if we need any or to contact you, we can. We know where to find you. You know where I live. <laughs> Okay, you want a phone number? No, I think we are. Yeah, we don't need a phone number. Um, and this one is a similar statement of uh, focusing on, oh, so yeah, the one that you just signed was for the release of audio and, and video content. Okay. It's mostly it's gonna be audio today, not video. Okay. Um, and this one is about the voluntary participation and risks and, and benefits. You have your, yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it's an interesting experience to be listening <coughs> yeah. and hearing. Okay. Perfect. That's it? That's all. Thank you. Uh, you you know, would you like a copy for your records? Yeah, I would like a copy just because I don't know, I still don't know what I'm doing and I don't want to take right. time sure. to do this because I'm on a time wolf.
we'll thing. Print those off for you right Not that I can't come back and finish, or you can't come back and finish with me, but you can already keep this. Okay. Uh, we'll copy these before Good. you leave. Good. Great. Well, once again, my name is Katya. I'm Katya. Just, yes. Is that with a K? K A T I A. Yes. Okay, uh, Katya. <laughs> John. Yes. And Matt. And Matt. Mm -hmm. The three of us are working on the Villa Terrace to okay. document and get the, sto the mm -hmm. building story out into the mm -hmm. public Good. in a way that is accessible. Um, so just for the, the record, would you mind just introducing, saying your name and mm -hmm. a brief introduction to yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Barbara Brown Lee, and right now I am called Emeritus Chief Educator. Um, I've been with the Milwaukee Art Museum for 50 years. Uh, I retired January 25th, i.e. I went off the payroll, but the director has let me keep my office, and I get to work as much and as long as I want, and uh, I have been in my office every day since I retired, just so you know. Uh, and uh, I love my work, and part of my life was spent at the villa, so I'll do the best I can to tell you what I know. Uh, but the memory's going a little, but uh, there you are. For example, I can't remember the specific date of the house, but it's 1922, 1923. Uh, you probably know this, David Adler, who was quite the snarky architect, quite chic of the week in the Illinois area, right? Uh, he was the um, architect for this, and um, the, I don't know the discussions about where the original setting was to have been, but I don't think they could have picked a better one. And as you know, out on the pillar, one of the pillars, it says Sopra Mare, and Sopra Mare is the name of it. And um, I happen to have visited um, a place in uh, Lake Como in Italy where they say there is a villa and I don't know how to say this in Italian, um, C-I-C-O-G-N-A. Ciccogna. Um, and uh, it's supposedly one of the models for this building. Now, I've been to Lake Como, and I've seen several, and I would say there are more than one because they're very similar. It's... It's quite a gem architecturally. And I know that the family wanted to save it, and I know that the community wanted to save it. It's just a matter of money, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. All it is is money. So um, my understanding is it had been offered to lots of places. The Milwaukee Public Museum was one that I heard it was offered to. Point being that everyone turned it not down, not because they didn't think it was a good idea, but they didn't know how they were going to maintain it because it has huge gardens. Um, it also has a lot of problems with um, this kind of stonework and it's, it's uh, big maintenance money. And the craftsmen, you know, have pretty well died out for these kinds of things and it's hard to find uh, although there's a lot in the country, and we would probably have pulled them in. But, um, but we decided, uh, and I'm trying to make this short for you, the museum had reached a point um, in the early 60s, let's say 63, 64, where we were discussing the possibility of incorporating along with paintings and sculpture, which is what people think of when they think of an art museum, you know, it's painting and sculpture, or let's say a fine art museum. We wanted, due to patrons in the community that were collectors of American decorative arts and uh, sometimes referred to as material culture, were very anxious to do something with the decorative arts and let the community share their collections. So that led to thinking about the villa as being possibly used as a house museum for us to show the American decorative arts of these collectors. And we thought, well, maybe the villa is our answer 
that we should take this on and use it as an addition up the hill. We're not far. So that's kind of why we decided to go ahead. Uh, we were a little bit naive because we didn't really get into a long study of what it would cost down the road. They had a caretaker here, a husband and wife, older. I would say they were in their 70s and left in their 80s. But they did a beautiful job, but they were more like um, shoveling snow, cutting grass, uh, sweeping, washing windows, that kind of maintenance, but not anything else. I mean, they couldn't deal with the roof or things of that ilk. So um, we uh, received the building in four increments of payments for tax purposes for Mrs. Curtis, who was originally Mrs. L.R. Smith, but she had three husbands that she buried, and we knew, we worked with Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Curtis, and she gave it to us in four increments. This is the final and inaugural, this is after all the payments had been made, uh, we decided to do an inaugural exhibit. Mm -hmm. And we chose at the time to show people what we intended, which was to make these rooms into, I hate to use the term, so put it in quotes, period rooms. Well, it's difficult to put American colonial period rooms into a 16th century villa without destroying it. And we soon realized that if we were going to do our job well, and we used as our role model Winter Tour, the home of Henry Francis DuPont in Wilmington, Delaware, that we would destroy the villa. That's not what we wanted to do. We thought it was too good, and we didn't want to destroy it. So what we did is to, for our inaugural, we filled it with um, kind of the history of our cultural apprenticeship and also the history of American decorative arts um, as a teaching collection. So we started with something called the Pilgrim Century, the 17th century, and we cut it off um, at the Victorian, following Mr. DuPont's um, tradition. But of course, later we changed that. And so now we go straight through to Tupperware, is what it amounts to. So the rooms um, were, we did not destroy the rooms in any way. It was very tempting, but we did not. And um, for that, I am grateful and thankful. I thought that was a wise decision. Unfortunately, Milwaukee County didn't have the money, the time, or the help to do their job, which was to maintain it. They were to do the gardens, they were to do all of the sort of major maintenance, and they were also to keep the villa up to snuff. And uh, this couple did the best they could. They worked their little tails off, they really did, and their heart was in it, they loved it. Um, and we all did, we all worked very hard, but um, after eight years, the art museum decided we have to leave. I had two jobs already. I, at that time, I was, um, in the early days, I was called um, curatorial assistant because I started uh, in training, and then I was doing the curatorial work for the museum, but I was also sent up here with our head designer and preparator, and I was also acting as a curator of decorative arts. I didn't have too much on my plate. So um, I said, you're either gonna kill me, and it'll be because of the villa or not, but I can't keep this up, even though I was very young and wet behind the ears. But having grown up just a few blocks north, in the city on Shepherd Avenue, I knew the neighborhood, I was comfortable here, and I knew many of the people that had played here as children and had always beloved, I think the neighborhood loved this, as well as the house across the street. So that's kind of 
why we did it. Well, guess what? We were very successful. And for us to make a move in 1975 at the Milwaukee Art Museum to incorporate antiques with painting and sculpture didn't hit me until lately when I realized that was a big step. That's a very big step. Most people don't do that. And even if they could, they wouldn't because it's not fine art. So we made a big, big gesture, and um, it turned out to work very well down at the art museum because we didn't have to work around a 16th century villa. So we decided that we had proven to ourselves we were ready to do this, and we did it, and it was probably the finest teaching collection within the collection for our school children. For the first time, they learned American history, but they learned it through furniture, pots, ceramics, textiles, but we didn't call them antiques and we didn't call them fancy names. We just called them what they had at home. We compared it to what they were growing up with. So this, we decided, would have to be taken care of by somebody else because the county just today, if you look at what the county's in charge of, they have 800 buildings to take care of right now in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Now, where's the money coming from? I don't know if you know this, but us. We're the taxpayers. And they can't do it. It's impossible. So it's a miracle that this building has survived, and it's only through sheer love and people like Beth Chapman, who's worked so hard over the years, who's now, what, in her 90s? Mm -hmm. And people like Delphine. I had beautiful docents up here because we had a whole group of docents who had the knowledge of antiques, decorative arts, and could teach um, what this house was and how it got where it is today. Mm -hmm. And when I go out on house calls to this day, for example, those two chairs in the window there came from a house way up Lake Drive where they were moving out of a family home. It belonged to Harry Grant, who owned the journal companies. He built 1260, which is the most, it's called art modern architecture because it comes after World War II. Everybody thinks it's art deco, but it's art modern, and he lived in the penthouse. And um, so I took them. I said, I'll take those chairs and put them in the dining room, but nobody will be allowed to sit in them and, uh, because they were what David Adler thought should be here, this kind of Mediterranean look. And then we brought all of our paintings up here. Um, that's hung way too high. Uh, and anyway, um, that's Guardi from Italy, who was Canaletto's kind of pendant um, in painting, and we brought things up that we felt were relevant. Those are, I think, I can't remember, I want to say Mrs. Vogel, but I may be wrong. We got a lot of stuff from Mrs. Vogel who lived across the street. But these were the chairs that Mr. Um, Adler put in, which are the same style, the same thing. So we tried to keep what the family left, like this room, as intact as possible because it is a statement of revival architecture in the 20s in our country. So, and we tried to keep uh, the bedrooms the same, and Mrs. Smith had um, one of her friends paint the, the dressing room, and Mr. Smith's bedroom had those coffered ceilings with, that's paper, that's hand-painted paper. So we tried to do the best to restore, including the wallpaper, which we found the original rolls in the attic. I found those one day uh, when I was hunting for something else. So when the fire occurred, we could have them copied by the same company, which is still working. Philadelphia. So we, unbeknownst to the public and the community, we always try to, to be good museum people. That's what I'm trying to say. And we, I've tried, I've stayed probably longer than anybody so that I can come up and tell people what things are when they find them in the basement and why they're here. 
And uh, the biggest question, and you maybe have heard this, is the overmantel, over shelf um, fire decoration downstairs, fireplace decoration. And I was in London one day going through the Victoria and Albert Museum, and I walked into a room, I said, there's our paneling from Bromley LeBeau. And it had been copied for a home belonging to Mrs. Dake, who lived just before you get to the park. She had a huge house um, that Tom Vanalia and his wife now are living in. And they've cut it the off, the part that hung over is half gone now. But that's where it came from. Well, in order to put it in the bedroom with the paneling, we would have had to cut it. And I said, over my dead body, you're going to cut that mantle. You're not going to do that. And I said, even though it's a copy, it's a damn good copy. It's one of the best I've ever seen. And so that's why it's in the basement. Or I don't know where it is today, do you? Probably. Still in the basement. In the basement, OK. <laughs> and I found a lot of furniture in the basement that I brought up here. And we recovered it and restored it, like these chairs and things of that ilk. And uh, there used to be a pair of sofas that the ends dropped down called Knoll, K-N-O-L-E for Knoll House in England, which is at this very moment being restored through the National Trust. Mm -hmm. And um, we kept those, we recovered them. Now the ASID, the American Society of Interior Designers, under the leadership of Bill Manley, who died recently, helped us put in uh, curtains, because there weren't any, and if there were, they were threadbare, water damaged and ripped and torn. So this chapter, Wisconsin chapter of ASID, helped us with fabrics, textiles, uh, upholstery, et cetera, et cetera, and helped us to make it look so when we had our teas here and our coffees or our luncheons or whatever, it really looked nice. And people, that's part of the charm. Um, we brought in a gentleman from New York by the name of Ernest Lonano. He's still alive in his 80s. He worked with the Metropolitan, Philadelphia, Boston, Winter Tour, Williamsburg, and Chicago. And his father was what was, I'm sorry, 